Hello and welcome to worship at MDUMC. I'm John Robbins, and I'm thankful that we can join together online this Palm Sunday. By live streaming, you are helping us remain a community, even at a distance. We want you to know that we're here praying for you, and we're here for you. If you or someone you know is in need of care at this time, whether it's prayer, a phone call, grocery delivery, or anything else, please visit mdumc.org slash chain of care. Fill out the available fields and a staff member will be in touch with you as soon as possible. Although we can't worship corporately, we are still finding ways to learn, live, give, and serve together. You can still follow along in our Lenten devotional at mdumc.org slash devotional and find community via social media on Facebook and Instagram. We are looking forward to journeying through Holy Week together. We'll be offering online options for services on Holy Wednesday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and even Easter Sunday, of course, as well as interactive options for children and Stations of the Cross. You can access all these opportunities at mdumc.org slash Holy Week. Your generous giving is still incredibly important. All the ministries that enable MDUMC to better serve God and neighbor here and around the world are made possible by dedicated giving. I realize that there are many factors impacting everyone beyond what we know is normal. These are unprecedented times and all of us are affected financially. If God has blessed you, this is an opportunity to bless others by helping us and this community. You may give online at mdumc.org slash give. And if you need any assistance, we're here to help. Contact Nina Davis at mdumc.org for more information. In times like these, I'm reminded of the comforting words that we find in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus reminds his disciples along the journey, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I invite you to carry those words into uncertain times. One thing we can be certain about is that God is with us and we are never alone. As always, we are thankful for your continued commitment to the mission and ministry of MDUMC. Worship will be starting soon. Thank you again for joining us today. We're glad you're here.
Let us join together in our call to worship. We come to prepare for the holiest of weeks. We will journey through praise with joy on our lips. We will travel through betrayal and death, cradling hope deep in our hearts. Jesus leads us through this week and we will follow. He is the life we long for. He is the word who sustains us. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Blessed is the one who brings the kingdom of God. Let us join together reading in response the words from Psalm 118. The Lord is my strength and my power. The Lord has become my salvation. There are joyous songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sorely, but has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you. Give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God who has given us light. Lead the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will exalt you. 
Oh, give thanks to the Lord who is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. Last night as I lay sleeping, there came a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, I thought the voice of angels from heaven in answer. In the highest 
Let us join our voices together for our prayer of confession. Lord Jesus, how well you know our hearts, and still you love us to the end. We denied you and denied our calling to serve one another. We have betrayed you and betrayed your commandment to love one another. Forgive us, Lord, and pour out your spirit of grace upon us. Teach us to serve you faithfully and to love one another by the example you have set for us. In your holy name we pray. Beloved, as followers of Christ, we are confirmed, we are redeemed, and we are restored by the divine love of God. And with these words of assurance, we can say the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our mission at MDMC must continue by serving you, our congregation. We are praying with you and for you for this pandemic to pass us by soon. We trust that our loving God will provide a way for us to move forward and restore our communities, our city, our nation, our world. We as the unified body of Christ can collaborate through the practice of generosity. Beloved, I wanna remind you that your financial giving is a gesture for good stewardship in building God's kingdom here on earth. You can find a link to give online at mdumc.org slash give in the comments.
I'm Miss Lauren. And we're here for children's time. So today, what do we have? We have some palm branches. So I got one from the front yard. I cut it off and I think it looks like a good palm branch. But what do you it have? It really does. I have one that I made. We have this template on our Facebook page. And so I copied it, printed it out, and then I colored it. And then I even attached a paper towel to make it even more sturdy, you know? So, so I was thinking, we did the, we did the palms because Huh, why did we make palm branches? Oh, I remember. It's, it's a, a Bible, Bible story. story. <laughs> yeah. So th the Bible story this week was about Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And when he got into Jerusalem, what did all the people do? They put down all of these palm branches. They even put down jackets and coats. And they were waving in the street singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna they're, in the highest. They were really excited. They were super excited. And Palm Sunday is a start to a journey that we're going to take all week long because what's next Sunday? <gasps> Easter. I love Easter. Now yes. Easter's going to be a little weird this year. It is kind of weird. But we can still make it special. Yes, most definitely. What are some things we can do to make, uh, help us to get ready for a good Easter? Yeah, so some ways that we can prepare mm -hmm. our hearts and minds is first of all, praying. Mm -hmm. Everybody can pray, and that is, you can pray when you're happy, you can pray when you're sad, and that helps us get prepared. Uh, the second thing we can do, do you have another idea? What's oh, another read idea? the Bible. Ah, great idea, Miss Allison. Yes, read the Bible, because there's a lot of good stories in there that will help us prepare for Easter. Good and idea. the last one, the last a one? good one, how about this? We help do something kind for others in our house. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, it could be picking up something that maybe didn't belong to you. It could be helping with the dishes or taking the dog on a walk. Anything that helps out another person in your house. Even doing something that someone had, didn't ask you to do. That would be nice. That's even better, yeah. So it's a special day today, Palm Sunday, and it's helping to get us ready for Easter. Hey, Miss Lauren, will you give us a prayer? I would love to. Okay. Let's all pray together, friends. Dear God, dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for today. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. On this Palm Sunday, we read from the 19th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, verses 28 through 40. I invite you to hear these holy words regarding Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. Asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, in the silence of this moment, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word for us this day and work your will in our lives. Amen. I like pomp and circumstance and ritual. I like things to be orderly. I like grand, big events that have structure to them. For example, I appreciate the inauguration of the President of the United States and all of the galas, all the worship services, all the people gathering together for an historic occasion. 
I like pomp and circumstance and ritual. I like it when the Queen of England travels to Windsor Castle. The staff raises the flag for all to see that the Queen is present. And as long as she's there, that flag remains. Once she leaves, they take it down. She lives in the midst of a lot of pomp and circumstance, a lot of ritual. I always appreciate it when it's time to elect a new pope. There's a lot that goes into all of that. When the cardinals from all over the world gather together to elect a new pope, there is ritual that is in place. Upon the first vote, if there is not a pope, then black smoke rises for all to see that there has been no election. But finally, when a pope is elected, we have a ritual that takes place where white smoke is shown. And everybody realizes that soon, in just a matter of moments, the new pope will step out on the balcony for all to see. I like pomp and circumstance. I like ritual. A long time ago, Jesus is preparing himself for what was, at least to some degree, a time of pomp and circumstance and ritual. People had been preparing themselves for one day the arrival of the Christ, the Anointed One, would come. The Messiah would appear. So Jesus gives instruction that those disciples who are to go and retrieve a donkey are to bring it to him, but it has to be a donkey that's never been ridden. It comes from the prophet Zechariah, who declared one day that indeed the one called by God would ride on the back of a donkey that had never been ridden. There's pomp and circumstance as Jesus approaches Jerusalem on the back of this donkey. As they ride along, as Jesus appears to the crowd, they start to place their cloaks on the ground. There's a ritual taking place. And as we know in the Gospel of John, people start waving palm branches. They're excited. All the joy and celebration is taking place because they are anticipating the arrival of the king, the one who will liberate the people. But they begin to be aware that this Messiah might be a little bit different. Is he the Messiah after all? They were prepared for the king to come in to Jerusalem on the back of a stallion, a sign of military might and strength. But Jesus is riding on the back of a donkey, a symbol of peace. Suddenly the shouts of Hosanna, the cries of blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord by the end of the week are going to change. Those same ones who would shout Hosanna would soon shout crucify him. Things would be different because of Jesus. Jesus was one who didn't fit the stereotypical idea of what a Messiah was to look like. Jesus was much different. For example, Jesus had to borrow other people's homes in which to sleep. One day, someone approaches Jesus and asks him, do you have a home? And he said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus was dependent on others to provide a place for him to live. In other words, he borrowed for a time a place to lay his head. We know that when Jesus enters into Jerusalem, he's riding on a borrowed donkey. And even shortly before his death, when he tells the disciples that he is going to be crucified, but that he will conquer on the third day sin and death, we remind ourselves that Jesus, upon his death, is buried in a borrowed tomb. So Jesus, in so many ways, seems to be one who doesn't fit the stereotypical understanding of what a Messiah should look like. This one who comes in peace when a crowd hopes that the Messiah will come ready for battle. 
So Jesus has given instruction. He has arrived in Jerusalem. The crowd has worked into a frenzy. Everyone seems to be so excited. But Jesus, in his own way, as he often does, has an unorthodox approach to how he goes about his ministry. This one we call the Messiah, this anointed one, in so many different ways, confused people. He healed on the Sabbath day. He touched the sick. Laws prohibited both of those things from taking place. He said unusual things like the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And in order to win one's life, one must lose one's life for the sake of the gospel message. Jesus was unorthodox in the way he went about doing things. And as he rides in Jerusalem, we see, of course, that once again, Jesus is doing what he always does. And that is ministry the way he chooses to do it. He has included people in his ministry that others oftentimes ignored or vilified. Prostitutes and tax collectors and other sinners. Those who were sick and ignored those who begged just to get by. Jesus embraced those very kinds of people and included them as a part of the kingdom of God. And so all of this kind of rises up to a climactic event in Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. This unorthodox way of coming in as the king reminds us, of course, that he is the prince of peace. And he symbolizes that by riding on the back of this donkey. So Jesus, in so many ways, was so unorthodox in his approach to ministry that even John the Baptist asks his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah or should we look for someone else? Jesus was not the expected Messiah in terms of how he related to people or what it is that he said, but he was God's son and is God's son forever and chose to do it the way he did it so that all people could understand that they are invited to be a part of the kingdom of God. But oftentimes in life, when we begin to believe that someone should fit a certain standard, a certain criteria, or we place them, if you will, into a particular category, whether it's realistic or not, and they don't meet our expectations, then suddenly, if we're not careful, we will turn on them. They've let us down. They've disappointed us. We've all done that at one time or another in many different ways. We set expectations for people when they don't measure up. We discard them or discount them. People have done the same to us. I remember when I was in high school, I used to listen to a radio station every day. And there was a woman who was one of the DJs on that radio station, and I loved her voice. And I created in my own mind an image of what she must have looked like. She would have been gorgeous. She would have been young, attractive, and appealing. I could sense all of that just by her voice. And interestingly enough, one of my best friends got a job at that radio station. And it wasn't long before I asked him, can I go up there sometime and meet this particular woman? He said, I'll make it work for you. I had an idea in my own mind of what she was going to look like based on her voice. I went to the radio station with my friend that day, and a rather large, unattractive woman came walking down the hall. He introduced me to her. She was the one who, in my own mind, I had created into this almost Greek goddess. She looked nothing like what I thought she should look like. She didn't measure up to my standard, that unrealistic standard that I had set for her. And I quit listening to her because after that, she never looked like her voice sounded. I remember one time when I was on the radio in another church, there was a couple who visited our congregation one Sunday and said they had driven quite a distance to hear me preach in person. They listened to me on the radio every week. And I said, I appreciate that so much. And my head began to swell a little bit. They would drive all this distance just to hear me preach. How wonderful it is. But then the woman turned to me, looked me up and looked me down and said, you don't look anything like your voice sounds. And she walked away. I never saw her again. 
I clearly did not measure up to her expectations about what I ought to look like. I think we've all done that at one time or another in some way with someone. Many people must have done that with Jesus. They had created in their own mind an image of what this Messiah figure should look like. This king riding in on a stallion prepared to do battle, to liberate his people. And yet the Prince of Peace comes riding in on a borrowed donkey. He doesn't measure up. He doesn't fit the standard. But he is who he is. And sometimes when we set those expectations and people don't believe we are who we claim to be after all, because they, in their own mind, created an image of what we thought we ought to be and what they thought we ought to be. When President George W. Bush was in office on 9-11, shortly after that, he received one of the highest approval ratings in the history of the presidency. But by the time he left office, he had one of the lowest approval ratings of any president in history. If you don't meet our standards and our expectations, we'll bail on you quickly. We see that with athletes who endorse products and get themselves in trouble. And the next thing we know is that they are invisible, at least for a while, because no longer do they measure up to our standards. For Jesus, the standards he set included for all of us an understanding that we're welcome to be a part of the kingdom of God. And for many, they just don't know what that's like. They had an idea, and Jesus chose to be who God called him to be instead. So here comes Jesus riding in on a donkey on what we know to be Palm Sunday with shouts and praise. Can you imagine what it would be like if you had the expectation that your military leader, the man of authority and power, suddenly were to say something different and act in such a way as to make peace the priority instead of strength and power? Can you imagine, if you will, we elect a new president of the United States who suddenly upon his or her inauguration, gives the inaugural address and says, things are going to be different now. We as the United States of America are going to learn how to turn the other cheek. We're going to forgive 70 times 7. We're going to go the extra mile for everybody else. We are going to be driven by peace, which means we are going to whittle down the military. Whatever it may be, we wouldn't tolerate that. We have an expectation that the President of the United States is going to lead by power and might. So many people had that same expectation for Jesus, and he didn't measure up. So shouts of Hosanna would become, by the end of the week, screams of crucify him, crucify him. This Jesus, we know, in so many ways, showed himself to be vulnerable. We know that he wept over the loss of a friend. We know that Jesus got tired and was worn out and would fall asleep in a boat even when a storm was rising. In so many ways, Jesus was vulnerable. And who wants a vulnerable leader? We don't know what to do sometimes when someone comes in preaching peace. We know how to deal with violence. We can lock down our schools. We can carry a weapon. We can be prepared for battle. But we don't know what to do when someone comes about bringing peace. It can be confusing for us. But it is a requirement if we follow Jesus Christ. So if today, on this Palm Sunday, you have set expectations for who Jesus is, and he hasn't measured up to your standard, remember Jesus is who he is, just as he is. Right now, with all that's going on in our world, all that we're having to deal with and being a people who have to stay in our homes, who worry about our health, and all the things that go along with that, so many of us have set an expectation about how God is to behave in the midst of all this and what God is to do. And if we're not careful, we can begin to lose our expectation, our understanding of what it is that God chooses to do. God is going to do it God's way and our responsibility is to follow suit.
Now, interestingly enough, the Pharisees say to Jesus as he comes into Jerusalem and people are shouting, listen, Jesus, tell your disciples to quit making noise. Quit cheering you on. And Jesus tells the Pharisees that even if the people are quiet, the stones will cry out. In other words, what Jesus is doing on his way to Jerusalem has to be done. It has to be completed. So on this Palm Sunday, we prepare ourselves for the beginning of Holy Week. All kinds of opportunities to worship online are going to be presented. Obviously, we cannot gather together as a body of believers, at least not physically, but we can spiritually. I want to invite you and encourage you this week to play, pay close attention to all the opportunities that we are going to make available to you on Holy Week to be in conversation with God, to set your expectations that God is indeed going to do something with your life because God already has. But God is going to do it God's way. And it's our responsibility to remember that and to follow suit. We know that what God has planned and what God has set out, that no matter what happens, God is in charge, God is in control. Jesus did it his way. He's always done it his way. He will always do it his way. Our responsibility is to follow his way, to follow his lead, to shout Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and to give thanks that Jesus is indeed the Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Beloved, let us join our hearts together in prayer. Jesus Christ, Son of David, you enter Jerusalem with a triumphal procession, knowing your own fate. We thank and praise you for your selfless sacrifice. For the redemption of creation. For those who offer their lives in Christ-like service around the world. for your work as it continues in our community, for the sacrificial love of those who serve us in your name, for our own salvation. The cries of Asana soon turn into cries of crucify him, and still today we dwell in the pain of a sinful and broken world. So we pray for creation. for the nations of the world and their leaders, for the church universal as it works on your behalf, for this community and those who are in authority, for this local church and its ministry. for persons with particular needs whom we hold in our hearts. Forgive our wavering discipleship and keep our faith constant, O God. Lead us always to a deeper experience of your love. Enliven us by the familiar but always new story of shame and triumph, suffering and hope that this week reveals. Mold us to the ways of the servant whose life we honor this morning. All this we ask in the name of the servant and king. Amen. Let us join together in our affirmation of faith. We believe that our lives are held within the encircling love of God, who knows our names and recognizes our deepest needs. We believe that Christ is a divine child of our creator and that the living waters of his grace can never be exhausted. We believe in the birthing and renewing spirit of God who yearns for our welfare as a mother yearns for her child. We believe that God dwells with us in the arid desert and in green pastures, present in hard times as well as in joy. We believe that our journey has a purpose 
and a destination and that our path leads toward glory we cannot yet imagine. We believe that as a church, we are fellow pilgrims on the road called to love one another as God loves us. Amen. So I say to all of you, God bless you. I hope you'll participate in all the Holy Week opportunities so that you can walk with Jesus. And I hope indeed that you will tell somebody about Memorial Drive United Methodist Church so they'll be a part of these Holy Week opportunities as well. And that when we gather back together, those from all over will come and share in the joy of what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. Blessings to you all. Amen.